And now I have the great honor to present Dr. Martha Grogan from the Mayo Clinic in her cardiology presentation. Dr. Grogan. Hi, Muriel. Hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and thank you, Tracy, for that touching um, memorial to Dr. Weissman. I just can't help but reflect upon the fact that uh, I know that she and I shared the podium at the uh, meeting uh, uh, last fall and how much I enjoyed being with her. So thanks to everyone. Muriel knows that, well, she seemed to forgot, forget that I have been bugging her for a while that we really need to have some virtual meetings. And so now thanks to COVID we do and looking forward to the in-person, but I think it's just wonderful that we can extend our reach. So we're gonna talk a little bit about amyloidosis and the heart. Uh, and then I'll take questions after that. I, I may not be able to stay for the whole Q&A. Uh, I didn't tell Muriel, but my 25-year-old refrigerator has died. So I kind of have to take care of that little emergency. So cardiac amyloidosis, we'll talk about normal heart function, how amyloid affects the heart, what are some of these tests that you're going to get if you have cardiac amyloid or, or are suspicious of having it, how do you know if your heart is getting better, and, and what can you do to help your heart? So just uh, a quick review because not everyone um, really knows how amazing their heart is and how it's put together. Your heart has what we call four chambers. These upper chambers called the atrium are basically collecting chambers. And the lower chambers, the ventricles are the ones that do the pumping that move the blood around your body. It's really pretty amazing if you think of it, uh, your heart pumps a total of 2,000 gallons of blood a day. So just think about that in the context of any other pump that we might have. So here's the blood that comes back to the heart after oxygen is used up, so we show it as blue. And it gets pumped through these uh, valves, which just keep the blood going in the right direction. When the blood gets out into your lungs, you pick up oxygen from the air that you have uh, uh, breathed in. And now the red blood, which is higher in oxygen, comes back to the left side of the heart through the valves and gets pumped to the body. So your heart is divided like this so that the high octane blood that has oxygen doesn't mix with what I would call the low octane blood. Now, what is transthyretin? We're all here today to talk about TTR amyloid. So, I always like to know where, where do these words come from? Transthyretin is a protein that we all make. And as most of you know, amyloid is a disorder of proteins when they misfold and cause problems uh, when amyloid deposits in the tissues throughout the body. So transthyretin is named because it transports thyroid hormone. You've all heard of your thyroid. And retinal binding protein, which is vitamin A, uh, for your eyes. Amyloid, as we mentioned, occurs when uh, protein misfolds, in this case, uh, transthyretin, which we abbreviate as TTR. And there are two types, hereditary or uh, familial. Uh, Katie will give you a lot more information about that, where there's a mutation that, you've inher that those patients have inherited that makes the protein uh, unstable. Wild type, occurs due to aging and other factors. We really don't know why it happens, but there is no mutation. And this type does not run in families. So if you have the wild type TTR, your family members are not at increased risk of getting amyloidosis. And this is a condition that we previously called senile systemic amyloidosis. So many of you will still uh, see that term. Uh, ASG has uh, uh, updated their uh, booklets so that senile term is not in there any longer, but you may still hear some doctors refer to it that way. The youngest patient of whom I am aware was 48 when he was diagnosed, so I know that this group does not consider that to be senile. And when I see many men, usually over the age of 65, that get this wild type, they really do like being the wild type uh, uh, a lot better than being senile, so it's a, it's a better term all the way around. So here's the liver cell producing this protein, transthyretin. And notice that it happens to have four components, like four heads to it. It's what we call a tetramer. It should stay like this and carry thyroid hormone throughout the body. But you see in amyloid, it's breaking up. And you can think of it as these subunits are kind of glomming together and they form the long stringy like gunk called amyloid that then gets into the tissues of the heart and the nerves and other parts of the body. 
And in the heart here, you can see that you have millions of cells that are all contracting and making your heart beat. Amyloid doesn't get inside the cells, but it gets in between the cells. So now when we look with an echo or other techniques, we will see that your heart is thicker, but not because you've built up so much muscle, it's because you have this filler in your heart. And when that happens, the heart becomes more stiff. It's harder for the heart to fill. Your heart should be normally very elastic. So it should squeeze and then relax. Like a normal rubber band, it should be able to be really stretchy. And when it relaxes, it should suck blood into your heart and then pump it out again. But in amyloid, your heart loses that elasticity. So it's stiff, it's harder to fill. And when that happens, you can think of it as fluid and pressure backs up into your lungs, makes you short of breath. You might get fluid in or around your lungs. And eventually on the right side of your heart, you end up with fluid in your legs and your abdomen and other places. So the common symptoms that we see with patients who have amyloid affecting the heart are those of heart failure. Patients are tired. They may be short of breath, especially with exertion. When things are more severe, fluid builds up as shown in this uh, patient. It might be difficult to lie down at night because of extra fluid uh, in the lungs and a patient might um, wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air. A cough is a common um, finding of heart failure often at night because again, fluid is coming back to the lungs and making the patient cough, but that cough will usually be better if the patient sits up. It's also common to get heart rhythm problems. In fact, many of our, um, especially wild type patients, they might have rhythm problems before they ever really have that heart failure that I just told you about. So here's the normal rhythm where you have kind of a normal pacemaker up in the upper chamber of your heart in the atria, and it sends signals through some specialized uh, um, conduction system uh, of fibers that then go down to the lower chambers of your heart. So you can, this is what you see on TV where it's a, you know, beep, beep, beep. That's a nice normal rhythm. In patients with amyloid, it's very common to get a rhythm called atrial fibrillation. And that's when those upper chambers, the atria are just quivering. But luckily your heart is so well designed that that quivering doesn't all get transmitted to the lower chambers. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to effectively pump any blood around. So the heart slows down and you have an irregular heartbeat in the lower chambers, but not quite as fast as in the upper chambers. And this is called atrial fibrillation. A variation of this is atrial flutter. And these are very, very common rhythm problems in patients with amyloidosis. In addition, your heart might go too slow because that electrical system is affected by amyloid. You might need a pacemaker. That's not uncommon in both hereditary and wild type, or your heart might go too fast as we just talked about. Important to know that there are medications that take care of atrial fibrillation. Sometimes there are procedures um, called ablations for atrial fibrillation. An electrical shock is something your doctor might recommend. But patients with amyloid, have an increased risk of forming blood clots in the heart, even if they don't have atrial fibrillation, but especially with atrial fibrillation. So whenever possible, an amyloid patient who's had atrial fibrillation needs to be on blood thinners. So if a doctor comes in and says, we're gonna do it, we're gonna shock your heart. If it's not an emergency, you always wanna make sure that your doctor has looked to make sure you don't have any blood clots in your heart which is usually done with something called a transesophageal echocardiogram. A defibrillator is um, similar to a pacemaker, but it's fancier and it can shock your heart if you have a bad um, heart rhythm from the lower chambers. The echo is a test that many of you probably are familiar with. It is often the first suspicion of amyloid. Sometimes um, doctors or healthcare providers haven't thought about amyloid, but the patient comes from an echo for an echo and the sonographer and the doctor looking at it suspect amyloid. It measures the thickness of your heart. It tells you about pumping function, stiffness of the heart, valve function, pressure in the lungs. A cardiac MRI can help tell if there's amyloid in the heart. It can often suggest that. And a biopsy of the heart can tell us for sure if there's amyloid in there. Um, sometimes we will use fat or another organ uh, uh, to help determine if there's amyloid. And then if the echo or MRI are classic, we might not need a heart biopsy. Really important for those of you who have been diagnosed with TTR amyloid of the heart is to know that uh, a scan called a PYP scan, that's what it's called in the United States, 
It's a bone scanning agent that can sometimes, but not always, replace the need for biopsy to tell us if there's amyloid. So I think it's important because we have a lot of people on the call here to know um, you can only use this PYP scan alone without a biopsy if your blood and urine tests show that you don't have any evidence of the other type of amyloid, the AL type of amyloid, which comes from the bone marrow. So I'm actually going to give you a little tip here. <laughs> um, if you haven't had a biopsy and someone tells you that you have uh, TTR amyloidosis, if you haven't had a biopsy of your heart, I think you should ask these questions. What are my free light chains? And did I have a negative serum and urine immunofixation? I'm just showing you some pictures here to show you how we kind of look at, at the heart. And here's this PYP scan. The green, in this case, is amyloid lighting up in the heart. Here is an echo showing thickness of the walls, so they're thicker than they should be. There's something called strain imaging, which I'll show you again in a, a minute. And it, this should all be red, but in amyloid, it looks like a bullseye. And on the MRI, this should be dark, you know, black. Um, for the heart and the heart doesn't show up as well as it should on an MRI. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of my favorite topics. Muriel knows where this is going and this is on some of the videos that we have. Is what is this number called ejection fraction? So you'll hear that heart failure is a condition where your heart is not pumping enough blood to meet the demands of your body. And ejection fraction is the percentage of blood that's pumped out with every heartbeat. So it sounds like all you need to know is this one number ejection fraction will tell you everything about your heart. But really it doesn't, especially in amyloidosis. It is just not a very important number. So I'm just going to go through these quickly, but to emphasize that ejection fraction is a percentage. So here's a normal heart pumping about 60% of the blood out with every heartbeat. The heart is like any pump or like many pumps, it needs to stay primed so it doesn't pump all the blood out. In some conditions like after a heart attack or some other conditions where the heart muscle is weak, the heart stretches way out and then it fills with more blood. It might be kind of weak, but it can still pump a reasonable amount of blood around. But in amyloid, the heart is stiff and you see that this left ventricle actually is smaller. So, the patient, the heart can pump half of the blood out, but it's half of a smaller number. So the bottom line is, I just don't want you to worry about only the ejection fraction. And those of you who know that that's one of my favorite topics, if you've heard me talk about this before. So just remember that a normal ejection fraction does not mean that your heart function is normal. And in fact, in many of our patients with uh, uh, amyloidosis, the ejection fraction will be in the normal range, but the heart is not uh, normal at all. So again, it's a, uh, the absolute amount uh, that's uh, really gonna be more important than the percentage. Uh, and one of the key issues with amyloid is you might be okay when you're just sitting, not doing anything, but when you get up and try to exercise might be when your heart really can't keep up. And if you want to be very sophisticated, I know Muriel likes to encourage people to ask your doctor all kinds of questions, kind of like on TV where you see ask your doctor, Muriel will tell you things to ask your doctor. Well, you can ask actually, what's my cardiac index? That's the amount of blood pumped out every minute according to your body uh, size. And what's my stroke volume index? Now, these are things that we can learn from a cardiac catheterization or from uh, an echocardiogram if it's done properly. Uh, and um, those are usually available on most of these reports. So those are some questions you could ask. I wanna just make the point that, of course, we're talking about TTR amyloid, not AL amyloidosis. But here is a, a patient with AL amyloid and the walls of the heart are actually normal in thickness but because of some of the circulating light chains in this condition, the patient was very sick and actually got a heart transplant six months later. But this patient has TTR amyloid, and you can see this wall is way thicker than this one, about three times as thick. But this patient with TTR amyloid is walking three miles a day. So amyloid is a lot more complicated than just thickening of the walls. And I tell you that because you're going to wonder, how do I know if these fancy medications are helping me? 
Another thing I want to show you, here's another echo. This is the septum. You've heard about the ventricular septum. So it's the wall between the left and the right ventricle. And I want to just show you that it's got lumpy, bumpy things that we call cords. It's not that easy to measure is the bottom line. And the heart is not completely uniform in thickness. So this is just an example of a patient where we're measuring wall thickness is 17 millimeters here and 11, 12 here. But guess what? These echoes were done on the same day. So it's just uh, when you're measuring these wall thicknesses, you're making a two-dimensional measurement of a three-dimensional structure. It's not all uniform, and I don't want you to worry just about that number. Here is what we do with strain. Um, this is a picture of the heart, the left ventricle. And if you could imagine uh, a whole bunch of little dots in here measuring the distance between the dots and how much they shorten with every heartbeat then the machine makes a computer map and shows us this strain. So strain is a more sophisticated way of looking at your heart function. And there are some numbers you'll see on your report that can vary from time to time. So again, you don't want to jump to any conclusions that things are worse without really talking to your cardiologist who's maybe looked at the images. But instead of being all red as it would be in a normal person, in amyloid, it has that bullseye uh, appearance. So your heart function is complex. Your heart actually doesn't just pump like this, it's actually twists and turns like wringing out a, t a towel. And we're eventually we're gonna be able to measure all these things. And I'm just using this uh, to remind me to tell you that there's not a single number that'll tell you how your heart is doing. And these pictures of the heart, echo, PYP, MRI, they are fantastic for suggesting amyloidosis and helping us make the diagnosis. But right now, they don't help that much in following up patients and deciding what we're going to do from a treatment standpoint. There are some blood tests that are pretty simple, but that can help us a lot. And uh, troponin is a protein that's usually released from heart muscle due to a heart attack. But I showed you how amyloid infiltrates in there, so you could imagine that some of these uh, uh, enzymes can leak out into the blood. So important to know that if you have amyloid, you could still have a heart attack, but also if you go into the emergency room for some other reason, they might get confused and think that you're having a heart attack when you're not. It's just the amyloid causing this blood test to be abnormal. And there's something called BNP or NT pro BNP. That's another protein released from the heart in response to high pressure. Uh, so in patients with heart failure, that goes up and we can measure that in the bloodstream. We can see that the heart is under stress. And following that over time can help us tell how you're doing, although it can vary quite a bit. It can vary almost 40% over a week, even when everything is stable. So for this one, we're looking for big changes to really notice if there's a change uh, in your condition. And the trend is more important than one number. There's also a simple blood test called prealbumin that we are using more in TTR amyloid, and it gives us an idea of how stable or unstable your TTR protein is. So we can follow that trend with uh, uh, treatment, whether you're on these medicines that silence TTR or stabilize the TTR. And there will be different numbers depending on which type. So as many of you know, after years of having very few treatment options, we are in a whole new world now uh, for the treatment of TTR amyloid. Uh, we know from other types of amyloid that if we can stop amyloid from being uh, produced and deposited in the heart and other tissues, that over time the body can probably break it up and remove amyloid. We haven't really proven that in TTR yet, but hopefully that will come. Uh, you might wonder, are there medications that take uh, amyloid out of the heart? Well, there have been a variety of studies, and there is one uh, trial that was just completed in the very, very early phases, but it's possible that we will have that option, but we certainly don't have it yet, and it could be uh, a ways off. Many of you know that you'll be on diuretics or water pills to decrease shortness of breath and remove fluid. And there are medications that are usually used for other types of heart failure beta blockers and ACE inhibitors that usually um, are not very effective in patients with cardiac amyloid, usually make people feel worse. 
But sometimes we need to use, especially the beta blockers for those fast heart rhythms. And so we don't want to say never ever, but it's uh, most of these medicines we tend to avoid. But your doctor really needs to individualize the treatment for you. So as we finish up, I'm just going to review what are the current uh, treatment options. So uh, at the level of the liver where I showed the protein being produced, that's where these are these new medications that most of us will call silencers. So they go into the liver and tell the liver, do everything you're supposed to do, just don't make any TTR. And those are enotericin and patisseran. And there's new generations of both of those drugs that are now being uh, tested both for uh, nerves and heart. Right now, they are only approved for hereditary patients who have neuropathy, but they can also have cardiac involvement. Then there are medications that stabilize this protein. So remember I showed it breaking apart. Well, tofamidus and diflunosol are medications that bind here and keep this from uh, um, breaking apart. And AG10 is another stabilizer that is in clinical trials. And I mentioned that there are some things that might help disrupt the heart. Uh, some of you might be on doxycycline and Tudka. There were some early interesting studies. There haven't been a lot of uh, data forthcoming recently and there's a monoclonal antibody that's been uh, in the early phases. So this just kind of tells you which ones are approved. As many of you know, historically, liver transplant has been used for hereditary patients. It's not an option for wild-type patients, but eventually we probably may not need liver transplant because of these medications. So what do you need to know? How are you know if you're getting better or not? This is, everybody wants to know this, but the medications that we have slow down the disease. They slow the progression of, uh, of heart failure uh, and reduce the uh, chance of dying from amyloidosis or ending up in the hospital. But unless you have a, a twin that has the exact condition as you, you can't really tell if you're slowing down or not. So simple things are important. How do you feel? How far can you walk? How often have you been in the hospital? How much diuretic uh, uh, do you require? And what do some of those simple blood tests uh, show that I told you about? Uh, those are really what we need a lot more than a lot of frequent echoes. What can you do as a patient? I think you should make sure that you have the right diagnosis, weigh yourself every day, look out for fluid building up, use compression stockings if you need to, be careful about your salt and fluid. And for most patients, once you're um, uh, stabilized from the standpoint of if you have really severe fluid, overload, you need to get that taken care of first. But you really should be exercising both aerobic and strength training exercising. And strength training is something that maybe it, it has been a little overshadowed by all of the emphasis on aerobic training over the years. But the way I think of it is uh, it's metabolically better for the heart to be pumping uh, to muscle rather than to flab. So we do know that strength training, not heavy weightlifting, um, but light weights can be uh, helpful for patients with amyloidosis. And here's some really simple things. These might seem overly simple, uh, simplified, but this is some general recommendation because this is a stressful thing for you and your caregivers. Make sure you're eating healthy. A simple goal is five fruits and vegetables a day. Make sure you're moving at least 10 more minutes than you usually would do. Get out of the chair, especially in this COVID era when we're constantly on Zoom, walk around and make sure you're getting some rest because again, caregivers have to be well as, uh, uh, in addition to our patients. So I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. And we do have some questions for you. So we're gonna, since we only have you for another 10 minutes so we can get your refrigerator running, here goes, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, this is from a patient in Ottawa, Canada, who's been on diflunosol, doxycycline, and ursadol since 2015. He said in Ju June 1st, he tried to refill his prescription for diflunosol in Ottawa, Canada, only to discover that diflunosol is no longer being produced in Canada as of March 11th, 2020. He says, I've been fortunate to have my U.S. doctor prescribe diflunosol for me through the Watertown, New York Walgreens. However, Walgreens has a corporate policy of not mailing prescribed medications to Canada or sending them by courier. So his questions are, one, 
Assuming that diflunazole will not be produced in Canada in the near future, is there any other pharmacy chain in the U.S. that would be prepared to send medications to him in Ottawa? And two, is there an alternative to diflunazole, like another NSAID that could be used instead of diflunazole? And here's the important one, three. The branch manager at the Walgreens in Watertown hinted that diflunazole may soon be discontinued in the U.S. Has anyone heard that may be the case? And then he thanks you. So go to it. Yeah, so just to back up, diflunazole is a stabilizer. Uh, Tefamidus was actually developed so it wouldn't have what we call the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory effects of diflunazole. Although some patients, if they could tolerate diflunazole, and sometimes if they have arthritis or things, it's a very good alternative. I've heard these rumors in the US, and I, if anybody else wants to pop on from the other cardiologists, but we've had temporary shortages, but I have not heard anything about it not being available in the United States. Historically, I have found that I think it's pretty difficult to ship drugs across the border. Uh, and we've had patients that have then come to the U.S. to pick up medications. Although, having said that, I realize that we do ship to famitas internationally. So I'm not sure, uh, um, and I will check with our pharmacy about uh, uh, about that. Um, and um, was there a third question there too? Um, uh, well, he said, do you think that's going to happen in the U.S.? Oh, and the, the other thing is the other, yeah, I said that as far as I know, I don't know of it being discontinued in the United States. If anything I've heard, uh, could it be a problem where they're going to try to get it labeled? Uh, and, um, you know, uh, then they would up the price. So if it was labeled specifically for TTR amyloid. The other really important thing is that other non steroidals like Motrin, Aleve, they do not do the same thing as diflunosol for TTR. So it's only diflunosol. You cannot take one of those other ones. Okay, great. Okay, here's another question. A gentleman named Steve asks, he says, I am not symptomatic. My mother died of TTR ALA 60 or ALA 80, whichever you want to call it, at the age of 65. She had heart involvement with some neuropathy. My brother is five years younger and he is symptomatic. He's on Tecteti and says he feels better. My cousin, who is five years older, is on Onpatro, and he too feels better. My doctor wants me to take diflunazole. What are your thoughts? So this is a um, patient that has no symptoms, correct, Muriel? Um, so, and, and I'm assuming not only no symptoms, but not any evidence of amyloid, but is a carrier. Co correct. As, of, as yeah. of so we really don't know the answer to that. I think a person should have an evaluation to you know, include both assessment for neuropathy and cardiac involvement, because sometimes a person might not have symptoms, but still could have some amyloid that's already started. Um, uh, for carriers, we do not have evidence. We don't know if it's a good thing for everyone to take a stabilizer. One of the um, key concepts that Katie will review is that not all carriers get disease. And every medication has a risk. So aspirin, for example, if everybody takes aspirin, there's a increased risk of bleeding and bleeding can occasionally be fatal. So diflunosol, increased risk of bleeding, bleeding from the stomach, not a huge amount of risks. So we don't have the data. Eventually, maybe there will be some trials, but for right now, a person kind of needs to decide whether they want to take it or not, but there's not any medical evidence to support that. Okay, here's another one for you from DECA. Do you think PRX004 will get off the ground? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, so um, again, remember that clinical trials go through phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, so they've done phase one and we'll have to, we'll have to see. Okay, here's another. Have the cardiologists noticed an increase in reports of AFib in patients on any of the FDA approved treatments? Um, atrial fibrillation is very, very common, especially in wild type TTR amyloid, but also in the hereditary forms, not as much. I personally have not noticed any increase associated with therapy. Okay. Um, but actually, I will say that if I see a patient, especially wild type, and they have not had documented atrial fibrillation, I'm very worried that we are missing it. Okay, and we'll get a chance to ask our other cardiologists during the Q&A that one as well, but we wanna make sure we get, 
we want to get our money's worth with you right now. Okay. Uh, can Vindamax and Petisran be administered concurrently or are they mutually exclusive? Um, that's a great question. So um, the two medications, of course, work differently. One silences the liver and dramatically reduces the production of TTR. And then Vindamax stabilizes the TTR that's remaining. Um, there's no reason that they can't be administered concurrently, but the benefit of adding a stabilizer already on the top of a silencer is not known. And of course, these medications are incredibly expensive. So I know if you ask Dr. Burke, uh, has told me if he has somebody on Petisran and that pre-albumin level is low, so that it shows that Petisran is knocking down the TTR, he usually would not add a stabilizer. Okay, and we'll, we'll give you one more, okay? Um, and that is, since it has been over one year since Vindical has been available to ATTR wild type patients, not in studies, what is the most up-to-date information you have on its effectiveness? Um, there's really not been new information because the major trial, the ATTRACT study, was of course the phase three randomized placebo controlled study. And that showed that people that were on tofamidus uh, had less chance of dying and of being in the hospital for heart failure due to amyloid than people that were not. Um, they also had you know, a slowing of the deterioration of their six minute walk distance and things. We have clinically seen that some patients do seem to stabilize more. But again, there's variability in any disease, and especially if we um, are catching some of these patients earlier, we, we, may, we may see that. So there's not really new data on tofamidus. We're just using it more. I think we can say that it's a very safe and well-tolerated medication. Okay. I did see one question on the chat, even though I know you encourage no chat, but <laughs> people are chatting anyway. Uh, someone who wonders if they've had a heart transplant, so we do know that patients who've had heart transplant for either familial or wild type TTR, um, if you know, if familial, especially if they haven't had a liver transplant, but if they've just had a heart transplant alone, the transthyroid is still unstable. And we have seen patients five, six years out that they develop peripheral neuropathy. There have been rare patients in which amyloid has deposited in the new heart. Um, the patients are often monitored for that because they're being monitored for rejection and they're having heart biopsies and things. So in the perfect world, it's probably reasonable for someone after a heart transplant to be on a stabilizer. Diflunosol is inexpensive and if the kidney function is normal, it could be considered. It's usually maybe historically been used in patients that have some neuropathy or some signs outside the heart. The famidus wouldn't be approved if there's no evidence of amyloid in the new heart. So I think we really don't know the answer, and I think we hope that eventually there'll be some studies to guide us in that regard. Okay, thank you. We're, we're going to run out of time here, but we really appreciate um, you answering these questions. And if you can come back to us after you get your refrigerator running, you know, we'll let you answer some questions. They are allowed to type in questions on that Q&A board, and I see Dr. Sarswar and some others have been answering, so that's really great. So thank you so much, Dr. Grogan. I hope you can come back. Thank you. Thanks, Muriel.